Rasulina Salatu Wassalamu Ala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alhamdulillah, we have uh, we're back with our family programs. The schedule for tonight is we will begin with the recitation as we normally do, but then, inshallah, we will have um, our bayan on Nuh Alayhi Salam from 6:40 to 7:20, roughly, and then from 7:20 to 7:50 uh, this month we have some uh, exciting. Uh, program. We have a Hajj panel for the brothers that just came back from Hajj uh, two, three weeks back. They're going to be sharing their stories with us, inshallah. So we have some questions that we prepared for them, and uh, they will be responding and sharing their uh, stories. After that, uh, we'll you know close off with some announcements around 7.50, and uh, by 8, 8.05, we'll begin preparations for dinner. Dinner will be boxed, but you'll have the rolls available to sit down, inshallah, and eat together. And by 8.30, we hope to wrap up, and um, Salatul Maghrib is at 8.39, so 8.40, and hopefully uh, we wrap up before 9 o'clock as we uh, plan to do. So now we'll begin with recitation, inshallah. We have two reciters this evening, uh, our admin, Hafiz Amin, and one of our ustadas, Ustada Yarba, and they will be setting the trend so that next, uh, next month we'll also have two more of our teachers recite, and then the students, you guys will be called upon inshallah. So the, the families should be mentally prepared. Your sons and daughters will be up here reciting within two months, inshallah. Without further ado, Hafiz Ibn Amin. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا أرسلنا نوحا إلى قومه أن أنذر قومك من قبل أن يأتيهم عذاب أليم قال يا قوم إني لكم نذير مبين أن اعبدوا الله واتقوه وأطيعون يغفر لكم من ذنوبكم ويؤخركم إلى أجل مسمى إن أجل الله إذا جاء لا يؤخر لو كنتم تعلمون قال رب إني دعوت قومي ليلا ونهارا فلم يزدهم دعائي إلا فرارا وإني كلما دعوتهم لتغفر لهم جعلوا أصابعهم في آذانهم واستغشوا ثيابهم واستغشوا ثيابهم وأصروا واستكبروا استكبارا ثم إني دعوتهم جهارا ثم إني أعلنت لهم وأسررت لهم إسرارا فقلت استغفروا ربكم إنه كان غفارا Assalamu <laughs> Oh, 
Takbir. Takbir. Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us to initiate with the recitation of the Quran. Inshallah, now we'll move on to the uh, topic of the evening, Nuh alayhi salam. And uh, this will be a first of many. We will do maybe two, three part series, inshallah, over the next coming months on the life and times of Nuh alayhi salam. So, with that, I'll hand it over to Mufti Saab to begin the program. And then, uh, as we mentioned before, around 7.20 is when we'll begin the Hajj panel. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله we are continuing our monthly family programs after a short hiatus and uh, we spoke briefly before about Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam in general, some of their attributes that they have in common, things that we have to believe regarding them. Then we spoke about Ibrahim alayhi salam. Not in too much detail about the finer aspects of his life, but that which related to Hajj because we were in the Hajj season. So, of course, I know some may think that we're not going in chronological order. And still we're not because had we been going in chronological order, we would have talked about Adam alayhi salam. But, you know, we're going to be jumping around between different Anbiya alayhi salatu salam. So we decided we wanted to speak about Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh alayhi salam is mentioned in the Quran often. His story is mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, repetitively throughout the Quran so that we may take guidance from him. So we're going to talk about him. He's. We also talked about the Ulul Azam prophets. Anyone remember who the Ulul Azam prophets are? Any, anyone? How many? How many are there? Five. And then there are. Who, who are they? Musa alayhi salam. Hmm? Isa alayhi salam. Well, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. It's three. Ibrahim alayhi salam, and then Nuh alayhi salam. Right, so in order of, of rank, it would be Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa then Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, and then Nuh alayhi salam. I believe that is the order. Chronologically speaking, Nuh alayhi salam predates the other Ulul Azam prophets. And I shared another opinion with everyone that uh, every prophet is Ulul Azam prophet. Because every prophet had, uh, Ulul Azam means a prophet with a great amount of Azam and firm resolve. That's the quality of every prophet. So anyway, let's start talking about Nuh alayhi salam, aspects of his life, inshaAllah. 
Like Imam Saab mentioned, we're not going to cover everything. We're going to cover some aspects, and then next month and the month after, inshallah, we'll go into more detail. So let's begin. So it says here centuries of da'wah, and that is because we know the, the life of Nuh was a very long one. Now, according to some historians regarding his lineage, what is the lineage of Nuh Lineage meaning his who are his fathers that go all the way up to Adam alayhi salam. Now is this 100% accurate? It's not. In one hadith, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa he talks about his own lineage. And the lineage of everyone on the earth right now goes through Nuh alayhi salam. So we are the descendants of Nuh alayhi salam. Through his you know, various children, his sons. So we actually can trace our lineage back to Nuh alayhi salam. And then from him, back to Adam alayhi salam. So he is also, you could say figuratively, another Abu al-Bashar. Abu al-Bashar, father of humanity. So this, in a sense, could be our lineage. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says about his own lineage that it is true up to, you know, what people, the Nasab, the people who trace lineages. His lineage is true all the way up to Adnan. And then from Adnan all the way to Adam alayhi salam, people have told lies. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that it's been corrupted. People have not kept the exact uh, lineage from himself after Adnan. And of course, Adnan, and there's many, many people up to Nuh alayhi salam. And then from Nuh alayhi salam, as we're going to see, to Adam alayhi salam. So this is not 100% accurate, but Imam Ibn Kathir, the famous scholar and historian, he writes this in his book, uh, Stories of the Prophets. So he says, his name is Nuh alayhi salam. Son of Lamik, son of Mutaw Shalikh. So I was trying to not say that wrong. Mutaw Shalikh, son of Khanukh, who is supposed to be Idris alayhi salam. So Idris alayhi salam predates Nuh alayhi salam according to this, what is written in uh, Ibn Kathir's book. Idris alayhi salam, son of Yarid, son of Mahlayin, son of Qanin, son of Anush, son of Sheath, and Sheath is the son of Adam alayhi salam, father of man, upon him be peace. So this is apparently what some historians have said. Now Imam ibn Kathir, he's not really saying that this is definitely the lineage of Nuh alayhi salam, but he's quoting some of the people who do so. Uh, and then he does kind of refute this. So this is not set in stone. This is a possible lineage of Nuh alayhi salam to Adam alayhi salam. So as you can see, how many in between Nuh alayhi salam and Adam alayhi salam? Who can eight. tell me? Nine or eight? eight? Let's count. Excluding Nuh alayhi salam and Adam alayhi salam. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's eight excluding them. So that is according to a, uh, an opinion. But let's look at some other aspects that may aid this opinion or go against it. How much time elapsed between Adam alayhi salam and Nuh alayhi salam? There is a hadith in Sahih Bukhari ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. He says, and now the Sahaba, they're not going to say random things. They don't just talk about random things. If they say something, usually it's because they got it from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But it is also possible that the Sahabi, he learned about Ahlul Kitab. Ahlul Kitab meaning the Yahud, the Nasara, they have their kitabs and their histories. Sometimes it is possible that a Sahabi takes from them. So, you know, the Sahabi, they don't make it up. That's something we have to understand. So either he got this from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or he got it from Ahlul Kitab. But it's likely this hadith, he got it from Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he says, between Adam and Nuh alayhi salam, there were ten generations, all of whom were upon Islam. So he says, ten generations between Adam alayhi salam and Nuh alayhi salam. Now, what is a generation? The word he uses in Arabic is qarn. Qarn has different uh, understandings. So you could say generation, but you could also say a um, entire era of people. So... 
And there is other narrations that this is from the Prophet ﷺ. He says, all of whom were upon Islam. What does this mean? It means that those people between Nuh and Adam ﷺ, the 10 generations that he's specifically talking about, they were Muslims. Right? So some people, they say that uh, Qabil, anyone know who Qabil is? Qabil? Is it a good guy or a bad guy? Bad guy. He was a Muslim. Qabil is a Muslim. Right, so some people said that he, uh, in the Ahlul, Ahlul Kitab, they say that he worshipped fire and his descendants worshipped fire. But that's not true because of this hadith that from Adam alayhi salam, 10 generations down, they were all Muslim. Okay, so now uh, before we get to that, let's, let's actually talk about this hadith. Does this mean that there is exactly 10 generations between Nuh alayhi salam and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam? If you look at the last condition here, or the last uh, clause, or, or qeed, we should say. He says, all of them were upon Islam. So what Nabi sallallahu alayhi salam is actually saying in this narration is that from the time of Adam alayhi salam to Nuh alayhi salam, there were 10 generations that were Muslim. And this doesn't mean that there was only 10 generations. 10 generations were Muslim. There could be more generations after the 10 generations that were Muslim. Right? So th that's what he is saying here. He's not denying the fact that there were non-Muslim people after Adam alayhi salam, before Nuh alayhi salam. But what he's saying is there's 10 generations from Adam alayhi salam's time that were all Muslim. Then something happened and the Islam changed. And then Nuh alayhi salam came. And so understand the hadith, it's not necessarily saying that Nuh alayhi salam just popped up and then people just started doing kufr. It could be there was like 20, 30 generations of people, just the first 10 were Muslim, and then they lost their Islam. So that is what Imam Ibn Kathir says. He says, uh, generally, you can look at the word uh, generation in two ways in Arabic. It can mean 100 years. Some people say generation means 100 years. And if you take this hadith literally, then there was a thousand years between Adam alayhi salam and Nuh alayhi salam. Right? A thousand years. Because ten generations, if one generation is a hundred, you guys can do the math. If you're in Georgia Tech, then you shouldn't be squinting like that. <laughs> so, a thousand uh, years, right? However, Imam Ibn Kathir, he says that, no, this is not the, uh, the correct opinion according to him. He says generation is actually a era of people an era of people right so for instance our fathers are one era of people you'd count them as an era grandfathers another era great grandfathers another era so he says 10 of these and in the era of adam alayhi some people used to have really long lifespans we know how long did nuh alayhi salam live or how long did he give da'wah does anyone know 950 years right 950 years nuh alayhi salam gave da'wah so if that's the lifespan of one person, then 10 of these types of people. So it could be actually 10,000 years. 10,000 years. Okay. So all of these people were in Islam. So there's differences of, of opinion here. At minimum, there was 1,000 years, but that's less likely. It's more likely that it's like around 10,000 years from Adam alayhi salam to Nuh alayhi salam. And Imam Tabari, he says, the nation of Nuh alayhi salam was called Banu Rasib. He says that was their name. They were the children of someone named Rasid. Banu means children of. So you, you hear like uh, Banu Abdul Muttalib or Banu Hashim. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is from Banu Hashim. Uh, what, are, what other tribes have you heard of? Banu Abdul Shams, Banu Kalb. Uh, anyone heard of anything else? Banu Israel. So Banu means children. So children of Israel. Anyone know who Israel is? Yaqub Alayhi Salaam. Yaqub Alayhi Salaam's name is Israel. So Banu Israel, children of Israel. So these people, they were the children of Rasib, whoever that happens to be. Imam Tabari is a great mufassir, so he says that's who they were uh, the children of. Now Nuh alayhi salam, he is the first prophet, or we should say first messenger, sent to bring people back to Tawheed. So in his lineage, did, did, does anyone remember any prophet other than Adam alayhi salam in the lineage? Did you hear any name? Idris and Sheath, right? So Idris alayhi salam, he's in the Quran, but Sheath alayhi salam is not in the Quran. But it is mentioned that he's a prophet and he's the son of Adam alayhi salam. But they did not necessarily have to deal with 
uh, you know, kufr and shirk. Maybe Idris alayhi salam, because it could have been a long, you know, 10 generations could have passed, Allah alam. But Sheikh alayhi salam, probably not. The children of Adam alayhi salam were Muslim. So it is stated that Nuh alayhi salam is the first messenger to people to bring them back to Tawheed. And those of you who attended the uh, Yawm al-Qiyamah intensive that we had in Ramadan, we talked about the hadith of Shafa'a, intercession. Right? Does anyone remember that, the hadith of Shafa'a? So people will go to all, they will first go to Adam alayhi salam. And they'll say that you are the father of humanity and uh, you, know, you need to help us out, please do so. So he says, no, I can't do so. Go to Nuh alayhi salam. So when they go to Nuh alayhi salam, what did they say to him? So basically people are trying to butter up the Anbiya alayhi salatu salam. Like, Please, you're, you're the father of humanity. If it wasn't for you, then we wouldn't be here. And so then trying to uh, make him feel good and, and try to intercede on their behalf. So he says, no, I can't do it. He says, go to Nuh alayhi salam. So then what, what are the words they use to try to impress Nuh alayhi salam and try to make him do their intercession? They say, you are the first person sent to humanity on earth as a prophet. Now, it doesn't mean he's the first prophet. Because Adam alayhi salam, Sheikh alayhi salam, and if it's true, then Idris alayhi salam. But what it does mean is that he's the first one to engage in da'wah, bringing them back onto Islam. Because in the first few generations, everyone's Muslim. So you can still have a prophet sent to Muslims to remind them. Right? Just like we remind each other, a person doesn't have to be kafir for you to remind them. But Nuh alayhi salam, the first to bring back people from kufr and shirk. What was his age at the time of being selected as a prophet? Anyone know? What is the age of Nuh alayhi salam when he was uh, selected by Allah Ta'ala to be a prophet? Any guesses? 40. 40? That's a good guess. Right? So Imam Tabari, he stated three opinions. Imam Tabari, the, the tafsir of Tabari is a really large tafsir and considered very reliable a lot of people love that tafsir many people say that tafsir tabari is the best tafsir ever right but you know you can have a difference of opinion that's subjective right but anyway imam tabari he says there's three opinions about the age of nuh alayhi salam when he was chosen to be a prophet first one was 50 so that was close i'm sure someone probably said 40 because you know I think there's an opinion out there that every Nabi becomes a prophet at 40. That, that is an opinion. But it's not one here. The next opinion, he said, is 350. And so after 350 years, he was selected. Comparatively, if he lives for a thousand years or so, and a human in our times is around 100 years, then 350 is like 40 years, right? It's kind of like that. And number three is 480. So that would be like 40 years of age. And this was the view of Ibn Abbas. Imam Ibn Kathir, he says this was the view of Ibn Abbas. That he was 480 when he was selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be a prophet. So this type, of, these types of people were in the past. They no longer exist. This nation is very different. There's actually a hadith where Ibrahim alayhi salam, he's, he never saw anyone with a white beard because people didn't have white hair. And he, he grew a white hair, Ibrahim alayhi salam, and he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what's happening? What is this? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is, he tells him through wahi, that this is dignity and honor. So he said, oh Allah, increase me in this dignity and honor. And then he eventually had a full white beard. So people in the past, they didn't have white hair. They were very different, different type of people. And, and of course, they lived like almost a, a millennium. Okay. Now, where is the story of Nuh alayhi salam mentioned in the Quran? If you want to read about the story of Nuh alayhi salam, which surahs can you look at? So, who wants to guess? Surah Nuh alayhi salam, very good. There's a surah named after Nuh alayhi salam. Surah Al-Anbiya, where else? That, that is also a place. Right? Surah Al-Fatiha, nothing there. Baqarah. Baqarah is the longest surah in the Quran. It should be there. Should be, right? Let's take a look. The first place you find in Surah Al-A'raf. Surah Al-A'raf. Still a very large surah. You find the story of Nuh alayhi salam. Not just the mention of Nuh alayhi salam, but his, somewhat of his story. Surah Yunus, you'll find his story. Surah Yunus. Surah Hud is a very long, lengthy story. And that is, uh, 
Anyone know Imala? The Tajweed lovers, the Imala. That's the only place you find Imala in Riwayat al Hafs. Who knows the Ayah? The Imala. Bismillahi Majereha wa Mursaha. You don't find an A anywhere else in the Riwayat Hafs. For Hufaz and people who like Qiraat, they, they really like that A sound. You don't find it anywhere else uh, in the Riwayat Hafs. In the other Riwayat, you do find it A other places. Nis and, and things like that. Nasi, Nasi. But Hud, Surah Hud, you find Bismillahi Majereha wa Mursaha Inna Rabbi la Ghafuru Rahim, right? Surah Hud, Surah Al Anbiya, you'll find his story somewhat in there. But in Hud, السلام, that, that's a uh, large story, portion of uh, Nuh, some story. And in Hud, Surah Hud, you'll find the story about uh, the flood and how Nuh السلام, told his son to board the ship, and his son refused and his son drowned. Surah Al Mu'minun. Then we have Surah Al-Shu'ara. So Surah Al-Anbiya talks about various prophets. Hud talks about various prophets. Mu'minun, various prophets. Shu'ara, various prophets. Ankabut, Safat, Surah Al-Qamar, and Surah Al-Nuh, of course. He has his own surah. So these are the different surahs. Ten surahs where you will find the story of Nuh alayhi salam. Now, to understand Nuh alayhi salam's uh, environment, we have to go a little bit before Nuh alayhi salam, right? Leading up to why Nuh alayhi salam was sent. So we're going to talk about how idol worship started, right? So Nuh alayhi salam was sent, and he he you know called his people to stop worshiping idols. So we need to understand if Adam alayhi salam is in an era, and ten generations after Adam alayhi salam, there is no idol worship. And Nuh alayhi salam is sent to people who are mushrikeen. How did this happen? So let's take a look at this. Here are some narrations. We're just going to read these together, inshaAllah. Ibn Abbas, he says, and this is in Sahih al-Bukhari. This is a portion of a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. It's not the whole thing. So he's mentioning the names of the idols formerly belonged to some pious men of the people of Nuh alayhi salam. So in the Quran, in Surah Nuh, does anyone know the names of some idols that Nuh was telling the people? He was telling people, don't worship such and such. Right? He was telling them, don't worship certain names. So basically he was saying, Wad, Suwa', Yaghuth, Ya'uq, Nasr. You guys know, anyone who memorized Surah to Nuh, you'll memorize those names. So those are idols. So Wad, Suwa', Yaghuth, Ya'uq, Nasr. These were some of the names, the very famous idols in the time of Nuh So Ibn Abbas is talking about those idols. He says, the names of those idols formerly belonged to some pious men of the people of Nuh salam. So these were very pious people. Uh, Wad was very pious. Ya'uth, Ya'uth, uh, Ya'uth, you get confused sometimes with the names. Nasr, the names of people. They were not like statues of stuff. They were named, they were individual people. They were very pious too. They were good people. And some actually say we're going to look at the narration that these were the children of Adam alayhi salam. And they were very pious and, and famous amongst people. So he says here, when they died, Shaytan inspired their people to prepare and place idols at the places where they used to sit and to call those idols by their names. So we're going to look at another narration that will clarify this. So I'm not going to really do that now. The people did so, but the idols were not worshipped till those people who initiated them had died and the origin of the idols had become obscure, whereupon people began worshipping them. So this is in Sahih al-Bukhari. So this is a definite report that how idol worship began. Urwa ibn Zubair. Urwa, he was a tabi'i. Zubair radiallahu anhu, he's a sahabi. So his father is a sahabi. He said, Wad yaghuth yaruq Suwa and Nasr. These are mentioned in the Quran. These are idol names. But they were the ch children of Adam alayhi salam. So they were noble people. Wad was the oldest among them and he was the most righteous. This is the name of a pious person in the past. This is recorded by Imam Ibn Abi Hatim in his uh, hadith collection. Alright. Now, even more narrations and then I'll explain. This is kind of small but I'll read it out inshallah. So someone mentioned Wad, 
So what again, pious person, to Abu Ja'far al-Baqir, and he said, what was a righteous man and loved by his people? When he died, they surrounded his grave at Babylon, and they were grieving over him. So he died, and they're so sad because he was a righteous leader. They were crying. Now Iblis took this as an opportunity. He came to them. When Iblis saw their grief, he came to them in the shape of a man. And he said, I see your grief over this person. Should I not make for you a statue of him so that you may place it in your community hall and remember him by looking at it? They said, yes. So he fashioned a statue of him. So what happened? What died? And people loved him so much. So they're crying and grieving. Iblis sees this and he says, this is an opportunity. Imagine, remember before Adam alayhi salam, Iblis tells Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going to lead humanity astray. All this time, 10 generations or so, he's, he's incapable of bringing kufr about. He sees their intense love for this one person and he's like, this could be my opportunity. He comes to them in the shape of a human being and he says, you know, you don't have to cry so much. You don't have to be in so much depression. You can remember him. Take a lesson from what his life was all about. I'll make you a statue. It'll look just like him. And when you look at him, everyone can take a lesson and say, okay, what was all about, you know, giving to the poor? What used to perform a lot of salah? What used to fast all the time? So you guys can do that too. You can be motivated and I'll make you a statue for him. Put him, put this big statue in your community hall. You guys can gather and just look at him. Don't do ibadah. That's ridiculous. No one's going to do ibadah of a statue. Of course. But can I do this for you? He said, yeah, sure. That's a great idea. You know, we can take a lot of lesson from him. And that is one of the reasons why we don't have statues and things like that in Islam. We, we completely cut it out. Because people, you might say, okay, I'm just doing it to remember him. If your children are not brought up in the same way and they don't have that understanding of Islam, maybe they will just have the statue there. My parents, they had a statue. I want to keep that same tradition alive. Your grandchildren, they'll say, okay, my parents, they had a statue. Maybe they used to worship this thing. I'm not so sure. Their children, they're going to do sajda to it. So we cut it out completely. This is exactly what happened. And that's why drawing pictures of animate beings, making statues of animate beings, all of this is impermissible in Islam. But anyway, perhaps it was permissible for them. And we do know some statues were permissible. Anyone, can anyone tell me, anyone who knows, uh, let's see, who knows about Quran, which uh, Nabi uh, allowed statues mentioned in the Quran? Statues, they were allowed. Anyone know? He's a very powerful Nabi. Anyone know? He, he had control over jinns. Everybody knows that. <laughs> Sulaiman alayhi salam. The jinns would make statues for him. Among the various things that they would make is they would make statues. Now statues of what? Quran doesn't say specifically. You'd have to look at the narrations. But the jinns would make and then some of the jinns would dive deep into the ocean and bring pearls and things and treasures for Sulaiman alayhi salam. This is mentioned, I think, Surah Saad or around that area. Surah Sabah, one of those surahs. يَعْمَلُونَ لَهُ مَا يَشَاءُ مِن مَحَارِبًا وَتَمَاثِيلٍ وَجِفَانٍ They would make various like huge masajid for uh, Sulaiman al They would make tamathil, which is statues. And they would make these huge pots. With, you know, they would cook stuff for Sulaiman al Make huge pots that humans couldn't imagine. So anyway, uh, this could have been permissible at that time. So it doesn't mean, oh, look, they're just so horrible. Anyway, let's continue with the story. They placed it in their hall, the statue of Wad. Remember, Wad was the most righteous among the children of Adam, alayhi salam. And they would remember him. Now, Iblis, when he saw this, and this could be generations down the line. He already made the statue for them. He let them be happy with it. Iblis thinks really far down the line. You and I, we think short term. In 100 years or like 50 years, I'm going to be out of this place so my thinking about what to do is limited to about like 20 30 years at least thinks like a thousand years ahead of time so he might not worry about you he make he might make you do something small and you don't even know why you're doing the thing but three four generations down the line it leads to the kufr of your descendants possible he's planning ahead he has a long lifestyle uh li lifespan so anyway he, they placed it in their hall they would remember what when iblis saw this he came to them again and he said, shall I not make a statue for everyone? 
and then they can remember him in the comfort of their homes. So I'll make you a mini statue. You don't have to come to the hall. Great, come to the hall when you can, but I'll make you one for your house too. Easy. So they said, yeah, that, that's great. So he did that, and they remembered what in their homes. So now, not only is there a, a huge statue in the community hall, everyone has a statue at home. When this generation passed, their children saw what their parents did with the statues and continued the practice. This continued for generations until the reason for the statues being in the homes became obscured. They didn't know, why do we have these statues at home? We just have them. And then some people started to take them as gods instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They started saying, okay, we have them to do ibadah. And this is how uh, they started worshipping other than Allah, their great-grandchildren of these people. Thus, the first to be worshipped other than Allah was the statue of Wad. So this is a narration uh, that's recorded by Imam Ibn Abi Hatim. In another narration, which is in Bukhari and Muslim, Um Salama and Um Habiba, these are the two wives of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They're speaking, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is listening to them. They were amongst the Muhajirat as well, who did Hijrah to Abyssinia. We know that there was a first group. They did Hijrah to Abyssinia. So they were talking about their experience in Abyssinia. And they were talking about a very beautiful church that they saw. And then the beautiful uh, pictures that were drawn inside the church. You know, the Christians and uh, Yahud, they would have different pictures. Christians more so. They have all these pictures inside their churches. So these two wives of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were talking about how beautiful that church was and the pictures. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard this and he said, when pious men would die among these people, they would build a masjid over their graves. They're, they're regretting, they'll build a huge masjid over the grave. And then they would draw the pictures of that, that pious person in that masjid. And that's why we're not supposed to do that. Someone dies, you leave the grave there. You can make dua, etc. to Allah. You don't make dua to the grave. And we don't build a huge masjid over a grave. That's not you know, something that we should do. And, of course, we shouldn't have the pictures of these people. So this is what the qawm of, you know, before Nuh did. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, these are the worst creation according to Allah. Worst of humanity according to Allah are these people. They would build a masjid over the graves and then have pictures of people, uh, of these pious people. So this is the environment in which Nuh Salam came. He came a few generations after this. This is when Kufar was introduced into the world. This is how Shaytan succeeded in bringing kufr and shirk into the world, he works very slowly. So be very cautious of yourself. Sometimes you think I'm doing a noble thing, but it could be that shaitan is tricking us, and later down the line we'll see that. So as long as we're following Quran and Sunnah, and we are you know, trying our best and, and doing istikhara, inshallah we'll be safe from that. On a side note, if anyone has questions, we won't be taking any questions today, but... Uh, you can ask the questions in the next program when we're talking about Nuh in more detail, we'll answer those. So then the, the, if you do want to ask a question, uh, you can do so through Slido. The QR codes are posted on the wall on the pillar here and on the partition. You can scan that and ask, inshallah. Now, I think I'm allotted only four more minutes, so I'm going to cut it short, inshallah. But... We're going to talk a little bit about the da'wah of Nuh alayhi salam. So now Nuh alayhi salam, he sent to these people and they're involved in kufr and shirk. And we saw how kufr and shirk started. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-A'raf, the first place where we see the story of Nuh alayhi salam. Indeed, we sent Nuh to his people. Noah is Nuh. He said, O oh my people, worship Allah. You have no other God except him. I truly fear for you the torment of a tremendous day. So this is, the da'wah of the Anbiya والسلام, is simple, not difficult. It speaks to the intellect, it speaks to rationality. Very simple. He says, people worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone should uh, be careful if she can fall. Well, oh my people, worship Allah. You have no God other than Him. And I fear for you the torment of a tremendous day. So... The children can be kept because here there's wires. If they trip over something, then it's going to kind of uh, ruin the setup, inshallah. So, two things that he's mentioning to people. Two things that he's mentioning to people. Number one, single Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number two, 
يوم القيامة. These are the essentials of all the prophets. عليهم الصلاة والسلام. They came with the same message. Small details were different. That is like rulings and things like that. But the belief system of the prophets, all the same. There's no Nabi that talked about a different belief system. That is oneness of Allah and Yawm al Qiyamah. Absolute essentials. And this is why if someone denies one of these two, they cannot be a Muslim. And that's also why Christianity doesn't make so much sense. If you look at Judaism, they have a concept of one Allah to you know a degree. You know, it is in the Quran that they said some of them said that Uzair was a son of Allah, but the majority in today's time, they believe in one Allah. And if you look at the Old Testament and you see all the old, you know, previous prophets, they never talked about three gods. Suddenly, Isa alayhi comes and he's supposed to be a link between everyone, you know, before him. And he praises Musa alayhi and everything. And he's talking about three gods. It doesn't make sense. And he doesn't actually in the, in the New Testament. Also, uh, Musa alayhi never spoke about three gods. And that's why this, doesn't, this concept doesn't make sense. All of the previous Anbiya, even in the Old Testament and New Testament, whatever they're you know, mentioned of them, they always talk about one Allah and they always talk about Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So Nuh alayhi salam, he came with this message. In Surah Hud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Surely we sent Nuh to his people. He said, Indeed I am sent to you with a clear warning that you should worship none but Allah. I truly fear for you the torment of a painful day. Okay. So we're just going to talk a little bit more. I know I have about a minute left. Maybe I'll stretch it to three minutes. We're going to look at a very important passage. The same passage that Hafiz Saab mentioned or he, he recited in Surah to Nuh. And it shows you the da'wah of Nuh alayhi And then we'll pause inshallah. So let's take a look at how Nuh alayhi did da'wah. Again, it's very small. If you want to read the whole story, you can read a translation of Surah Nuh. Also find that passage in Surah Hud. Those are very good passages about Nuh alayhi salam. Allah says, indeed we sent, this is from the beginning of Surah Nuh. Indeed we sent Nuh to his people, saying to him, warn your people before a painful punishment comes to them. Tell them about the oneness of Allah. If they die upon shirk, they're going to have a difficult time in the Akhirah and Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So Nuh alayhi salam was sent with this message. He proclaimed, O oh my people, I am truly sent to you with a clear warning. Worship Allah alone, fear Him, and obey me. So another aspect of the message, all prophets call people to obey the prophet. It's not because they just want obedience, it's because that is what Allah tells them. You must obey the prophet. So Nuh says, fear Allah, worship only Him, and you have to obey me. He will forgive you your sins and delay your end until the appointed time. Indeed, when the time set by Allah comes, it cannot be delayed. If only you knew. Meaning you'll have a good life if you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the time of your death comes, you cannot delay that. He cried, my Lord. So now in, in Surah Nuh, Nuh alayhi salam, he gives a da'wah. Then his qawm, they deny him. They Sometimes they physically harm him. They verbally harm him. We'll see this in this surah. He cries to Allah in a dua. My Lord, I have surely called my people day and night. Day and night he's doing da'wah. But my calls only made them run farther away. So what was the reaction of the people when he would give da'wah? They would run away from him. And whenever I invited them to be forgiven by you, that's what he's doing. That's what the Prophet is doing. Every Nabi, he's calling us to be forgiven. That's all they want. I want people to be forgiven. I want them to be accepted by Allah. That's what they're calling us towards. That's what Quran and Hadith is all about. Forgiveness. You need to be forgiven by Allah. Do these things so that you may be forgiven. So every time I call them to be forgiven by you, they, they would press their fingers into their ears. So another reaction of Qawm Nuh is they would press their fingers into their ears. They didn't want to hear what he would say. You know, like when you're really immature and someone is arguing with you and they start bringing all these proofs and you, you say, la, 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 la. So that's what they're doing. They put their fingers in their ear. I can't hear what you're saying. And then they would walk away the Prophet of Allah. And then they would cover themselves with their clothes. So not only would they press their fingers in their ear and run away, they would cover themselves in shawls and stuff like that so he couldn't tell who they are. They tried to make, you know, avoid him. They would run away. They would persist in denial and act very arrogantly. 
So he's crying to Allah in a dua. Oh Allah, I'm trying my best. I'm calling them day and night. Hundreds of years are going by. They're not listening. He's, he continues. This is the statement of Nuh. Then I certainly called them openly. So he used to go them in, in, go to them in solitude. He'd go to each individual person when no one's around. He would talk to them one on one. Then they would react in that way. Then he says, I started calling them publicly, openly. Then I surely preached to them publicly and privately, saying, Seek your Lord's forgiveness, for he is truly most forgiving. He will shower you with abundant rain, supply you with wealth and children, and give you gardens as well as rivers. So he promises them, if you worship Allah, you'll have all of these beautiful things. Just follow me. Still, they don't accept. And he continues, what is the matter with you? That you are not in awe of the majesty of Allah. You can see the change in the da'wah of Nuh This is like hundreds of years. He starts very softly, individually calling people. They react in that manner. Then he starts calling them openly and publicly. And then also, they're not coming back to him. He's promising them, inviting them, motivating them. Allah is going to cause it to rain. He's going to give you a lot of children, fruits, everything you want. Just accept Islam. They reject it. Then he goes to a more severe type of da'wah, which is warning of punishment. It says, what's the matter with you that you're not in awe of the majesty of Allah when He truly created you in stages of development? Do you not see how Allah created seven heavens, one above the other, placing the moon within them as a reflected light and the sun as a radiant lamp? He's talking about the different signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nature. He's trying to bring them to the oneness of Allah. Allah alone caused you to grow from the earth like a plant. You grew from the earth. You ate the food and produce of the earth. Then he will return you to it. You will die and go back to earth. And then simply bring you forth once again. And Allah alone spread out the earth for you to walk along its spacious pathways. So this is from Surah Nuh. So everyone is encouraged to read this surah so you can get a better idea. Now the last thing, the duration of Nuh alayhi salam's uh, da'wah. Allah says in Surah Al-Ankabut, Indeed, we sent Nuh to his people, and he remained among them for a thousand years less 50, 950 years. Then the flood overtook them while they persisted in wrongdoing. So this is all we're going to do now, inshallah. And uh, next month, we're going to go into more detail about Nuh alayhi salam. We'll do a recap of all of this, and then we'll continue talking about what was the reaction of his people to the da'wah. Then talking about when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed him to build the ark how he built the ark, what occurred after that, and the entire story, and also lessons that we can take from that, inshallah. So we're going to pause here. Sallallahu tabaraka wa ta'ala ala khayri khalqihi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een wa rahmatik ya rahmeen. So inshallah, alhamdulillah, from our community, we have a few people who have gone for hajj. Uh, we have Brother Uthman and Brother Hasib. Alhamdulillah. They've gone for Hajj and they're willing, alhamdulillah, to share with us some of their experiences. So we invite them here, Brother Uthman, Brother Hasib. Uh, you can sit anywhere to my left or right. And uh, we have some questions that we want to ask so that we may gain from your experience, inshallah. So we will do that now, inshallah. Alaykum assalamu alaykum. Have a seat. I'm going to have... Ask you guys some questions. Right. Let me put this here. Okay, so I have a few questions. Or myself, Imam Sa, we put some things together. and we, uh, Imam Sa probably asked some of the brothers, you know, some of the pertinent questions that they would like to know. So we have some of this, inshallah, and we're going to get some of the experience. I know I took a little bit long on the, uh, the program, a little bit five, six minutes over time. But uh, this is the more important aspect so that we can learn. So everyone, please pay attention. And uh, if you've gone for Hajj, you probably have had similar experiences or different experiences. And if you have not, this can be a um, way to prep. So first question I'm going to first give uh, to Brother Uthman and then Brother Hasib, inshallah. Number one out of the few questions that we have, what are some preparations you took before starting the journey of Hajj? In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَزَوَّدُوا فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ taqwa." Take a provision with you, and the best provision is taqwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. So we all already know what's the best provision, that's taqwa. What would you say is the second best provision that you took with you 
before going for Hajj? It could be something physical or non-physical, but what is the best type of prep? So uh, I'm gonna do two responses to this. Uh, you, you can you can put it on and show. Oh, okay. Three. I think better. Yeah. Is it the right way? Yes. Yes. Okay. Jazakallah So yeah, I mean, brother Rifat requested me to do both the responses, one from me and one from my wife. So uh, in terms of my preparations, um, I think I was more focused on learning what to do in Hajj. And uh, I mean, Mufti Saab can talk more about it. So there are three aspects of Hajj. First is Faraz, right? So you have to absolutely do, do those three things. If not, your Hajj is not valid, right? So being in the state of Ihram, and then, uh, you know, staying in the time of uh, Arfa, and then doing Tawaf uh, Abida when you're leaving, right? So these three are first. So you have to absolutely do that. And there's a list of Wajibats that you need to also do which if you miss, you have to do uh, Qurbani, right? So, and then there's a list of Sunnahs. And uh, I mean, again, uh, it's recommended, I mean, it's highly recommended to perform all the Sunnahs and do the things according to it, but it's mostly difficult because again, Rasulullah did this with, uh, uh, you know, 100,000 people, mm -hmm. but now there are about 3 million people who are doing it. The space is safe, right? So there's a high chance that you may miss some of that. Uh, I mean, these are the things that I was purely focusing on because, I mean, I shouldn't say it, but I was like, alhamdulillah, I'm young, I play sports, so all the walking and everything else, you know, I can do it. So these things are the ones that I really focused on learning. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, in the advices on the next part, but this is where I was focusing. And my wife, uh, I think uh, uh, she had a little bit different uh, approach. I mean, obviously she also did all of these, but in addition to this, uh, my, uh, I mean, we have two kids, one is three year old and the other one is nine months old. So we are trying to kind of uh, keep them away. And uh, the other preparation is that uh, we left uh, to India like two or three months before so that the kids can stay in India and get used to them. So these are the things that we did. So to summarize, knowledge, one of the best, one of the most important things. And I can tell you from my experience, Hajj is one of the hardest parts of Ibadat. Why? Because Salah we do every day, fasting every year and you know throughout the year, Zakah once a year, Hajj once a lifetime. So even like Brother Uthman would know how to perform Hajj better than me. So I've never done it. I can tell you what the book says. Now I don't want to take their time, but I'll tell you a story. Mulla Ali Qari, rahimahullah, huge scholar, many books we still study, about 500 years ago. He wrote a book on Hajj. He went to Hajj and he started doing Tawaf this way, which is the wrong way. You do Tawaf this way, to your right. So he starts doing Tawaf and someone stops him, brother, what are you doing? He's like, I'm doing Tawaf. He's Mulla Ali Qari, he wrote a book on Hajj. The guy's like, this is not how we do Tawaf. You know, here's a book. It's a really good book on Hajj. He hands him his own book. This great scholar wrote this book. You need to read this book. He wrote the book. He doesn't know who he is. He's like, you do Tawaf this way. Right? So experience is completely different, and you do have to learn. And that is a very beautiful advice. So to uh, Brother Hasib, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa sorry if I do not speak. I'm not a public speaker. I think this is the first time that I'm doing... Uh, speaking on public forum. Uh, I totally uh, convey with what his mom said. Uh, we, we went to multiple YouTube videos on the rituals that we have to do in Hajj. That, that's very important. And there is there are a lot of chances that we forget doing that. Day. Like one example if I have to give, like we wear haram and then when we do tawaf, Sometimes we forget, we have to keep this portion open. Sometimes we forget we keep this portion. And then we see people, oh, this thing is happening. So we have to quickly change. So that is one. And then uh, I think Rukma Yamani, there we have to, from Rukma Yamani to Hajar uh, we have to uh, read Rabbana Atea. So we tend to forget that. So one very important aspect is see multiple YouTube videos, call them, you know, learn from them. So that is one common mistake we all make. So you have to know why we are doing, what we are doing in Arafat, why we are going to Mina, 
why we are going to Jamrat. So this is one primary very important factor that we have to do. And then once we wear Ahram, we, do, we should not do Ikar or spend. So, and then somebody comes, hey brother, you are going there. Where this is, I mean, lot, this is mostly happening in India, Pakistan and Bangladesh, where people come and they put flowers and the flower mm -hmm. thing. And so you have to stop them. So small mistake and then you have to dump uh, for those mistakes. So that is like this, there are so many mistakes that we are going to do. So the more kind of videos that you see, the more, the more well prepared you get. Okay, so Brother Hasi was given good examples. Another really good example is, remember, you can't put on any fragrance when you're in the ihram. So, of course, you're not going to start, like, spraying yourself and stuff. Shampoo, soap, deodorant, this is habit. So you have to fight the habit. You cannot use any of this stuff. Or you get, I don't know, some kind of uh, stuff without scent, but don't, just don't do it, right? I mean, you can, but just don't do it. So once in a lifetime, if you smell bad, just like in Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a hadith Qudsi, the bad breath for you and me is more fragrant to Allah than mist. So the bad smell that you perceive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's so fragrant. So inshallah, moving on to the next uh, question for Brother Hasib. So we're going to you know, give each other uh, different uh, terms. Many of our audience might not be aware, but as you know, there are three types of hajj. So there's, there's tamattu, aqiran, ifrad. These are terms that you have to learn before going for hajj. Which one of the three did you do? And if Allah took you again, is that the type that you would do again? Why or why not? So there's three types of hajj. Which one did you do? And why, why, or why not? And was that a good idea in your uh, perspective? You can just put like this, yeah. So I did Hajjat Tamuddu, which is the most common and uh, thing that uh, everybody does for the first time. Uh, I, if I go the next time, I most probably will be doing the Hajjat Khiram. Uh, I will tell the Hafizah to tell more details about that. But uh, if I did from Hajjat Tamuddu, and if I get an opportunity, I'll go Hajjat Khiram. So inshallah, there's, there's three types. Basically, do you combine an Umrah with the Hajj or not? Then you'll get Tamattu'a, Qiran, Ifrad. Qiran is like separate. You do both. You do them in full. Tamattu'a, you do like you mix them together. So you, you get the most out of your time kind of, but it's easier. So you do a Hajj and Umrah mixed. And Ifrad is just Hajj, no Umrah. So the brother was saying that he did tamadur, so basically fused together, and next time he's going to do them separately, which is more difficult and more rewardable because it's more difficult. You have to wear the ahram uh, till so in in, in Hajj Khiran, you have to wear the ahram from your umrah start day till your Hajj is completed, which is the tenth day or twelfth day of uh, Hajj. So that is why. For those 10 12 days, you have to wear ahram. You cannot, you know, uh, take uh, soap, you cannot put, uh, you know, perfume. Uh, so, there will be a lot of restrictions that you have to do if you are doing Hajj Khiran. Mostly, the Hajj Ifrad is for the locals. They come and join us on the day of Mina and they, they are done on the day of Arfat. So, no, not Arfat, I think the third day of Jamrat. So, those five days only, the locals, uh, mostly for the Saudi locals. They, they join us on the day of Mina and then they do for five days and then they go away. So that's the difference between these three. The, the other way, yeah. Other way. This way. Yeah, like that. It goes. Oh, there. yeah. This is good. So yeah, I think uh, brother and uh, Ufis have covered it really good. So yeah, I think uh, uh, I, we also did Hajj Tamuttu. Again, it's dependent on mostly with the group that you go in because uh, again, you have a choice obviously. So like Ufis have said, uh, Hajj Khiran is most difficult one because you start with the day of Umrah and then depending on how early you go from the Hajj time, you have to stay in the Ihram throughout yeah. the time. 
and uh, again mufti sahab can uh, correct me if i'm wrong but uh, according to multiple narrations rasulullah sallam performed hajj e firan and then uh, his uh, wish was he had a wish that inshallah if i get to do hajj one more time i would do tamattu right so the difference is uh, with hajj tamattu let's say you go five days or six days before hajj right so you perform umrah you complete all the rituals you shave your head and then you come out of ihram and makkah becomes your mika right so your next spot to tie ihram right before the day of hajj and leave to mina so that's the major difference and uh, like uh, brother said uh, hajj ifrat is for people who live in mika so what that means is people of makkah jidda whoever belong to that area only they can do that right so that's the major difference and yeah uh, hajj ifrat is uh, because you have to stay in the state of ihram and being in state of ihram means uh, like you said lot of challenges right so uh, you have to be particular about not rubbing your head that much no using scents and uh, i mean in our town we keep saying things which we don't normally yeah. should say during the state of ihram so i mean five days is alhamdulillah good for ihram <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's personal experience right so yeah alhamdulillah mashallah I'll get used to it now. Yeah, yeah, so um, once you learn about these things, you'll learn about how difficult ihram is. It's not easy. It's like, I don't know, you, you're, you're in a state of complete servitude to Allah. 100% slave. Let's say right now you're like 10% slave. You become 100% slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time. You know, it's, just, it's very uh, difficult if it's prolonged. So in Quran it becomes prolonged. So that's why... Some say the reward is even more. Next question. Can you share two of the most difficult things that you underwent during the whole process that perhaps you underestimated? And one caveat, inshallah, if there's something that you don't want to mention, of course, that's fine. Uh, if you got into a fight with someone over there or something you don't want to mention, that's fine. Uh, but uh, whatever you feel is munasib, inshallah. again for this i think i'll have two responses one from me and one from my wife so for me the biggest challenge was the heat i mean i really underestimated the heat as like yeah i mean we've lived in i mean i've lived quite a bit in oklahoma i did my master's there so i'm like yeah 100 degrees not a big deal but it was 120 degrees fahrenheit and it was crazy i mean subhanallah especially on the day of arafah uh, i mean that day is the day where I mean, arguably the hottest day of the year, and uh, that I underestimated. Uh, and I mean, we I see people who are just 16 year old build everything and they're fainting, wow. and then mashallah, people who are 85 years old and very healthy. So Allah, Allah, Allah gives all the strength. So you know, you cannot really say that. So that's one piece that I really underestimated. And then a lot of people, like everybody, alhamdulillah, my parents have done Hajj, my brother has done Hajj. So everybody says. Yeah, you have to do a lot of walking, you have to do a lot of walking, right? So like I said before, I play sports and I do a lot of walking on a regular basis. And they're like, yeah, walking is not a big deal, right? But it's inclined walking. Understand, <laughs> all these roads are made on mountains, right? So it's inclined walking in 120 degrees. So that was the most difficult part for me. So, but alhamdulillah, there are a lot of resources. Uh, you know, people give water every days, right? You know. Every 10 stuff, there are people who are throwing cold water on you, they're showering. There are a lot of, Alhamdulillah, uh, you know, Allah has uh, uh, blessed the Saudi people to do all of these things, and mashallah, they're doing really good. I mean, it's unimaginable how they can, you know, make this. I mean, it's Allah's support behind everything, but still, in terms of the things that they are doing, it's mashallah really good. So, for my wife, I think, uh, um, I shouldn't say this, but she's a bit shorter than me. So, her biggest problem was. She's like, I never imagined with such a big crowd. Because, I mean, imagine you're walking with the crowd all the time. There's, there's never a time when you're not walking with the crowd. So everybody's right there and then you're packed. And uh, yeah, that, that was, uh, it feels suffocation. I mean, sometimes you don't understand, but you feel suffocated, yeah. especially during the uh, arkans, right? When you're throwing the stones at the marat or when you're doing tawaf. It becomes really difficult. Sometimes she wasn't able to breathe, so I had to kind of do like this to kind of control that. 
and things like that. But yeah, these are the things that, uh, and again, the walking, like I said, even she suffered the most on the walking part. But again, Alhamdulillah, this is the, there's a reason why Allah kept it once in a lifetime, right? I mean, like Mufti Saab said, this this is not an easy ibadah. But, inshallah, this is the best experience I've ever had in my life. Okay, so again, the question: What is uh, the two? What were the two most difficult aspects, and perhaps you underestimated, the two, brother Hasib? I think uh, ninety percent of the people who go to Hajj will pay the same thing, walking. Uh, I'll just add to them what he says. We normally prepare a lot. Everybody will say that you have to walk a lot, and then I did the same thing. So I walk. I used to walk for four miles, five miles, six miles. But the difference is, here we walk with Nike shoes, Adidas <laughs> shoes. There you have to walk barefoot. Oh, wow. And you have to walk on the marble uh, flooring. So that's the difference. So you have to walk. If you are preparing for Hajj, take off your shoes and then put them and walk. So that's the difference. And then you walk under the sun, and you please do not wear like track point or you wear you wear a what you call lungi or something. So you do with that. There is a lot of difference uh, between you you coming with a track point and the arrow. So that's a, one of the most difficult part you face there is that you know please do not do walking with shoes. You wear and one I think I want to add one more thing like when we come from Jamrat to uh, Makkah to do uh, Hajj Ziyara, so you come with uh, slippers. So make sure that your slippers are smooth enough. That, you know you have to walk for 10 kilometers from there to here so don't take slippers that are very you know hard take it for soft and smooth uh, slippers that makes a lot of difference and then as you said you know under the sun do as much as, as you can under, under the sun the problem is uh, the sun will be hitting your head you will be shaved already fully no hairs on that and then you cannot put your arm also on the head because so and then you only have you can put your hands and then so that's very important that you know we, we can think of like you know I can put a hat I, I can put the arm on the head so that's not allowed so if we, if by mistake also you do that then you have to give dam dam means again you have to <laughs> that's the long part and then same like Majid and Nibra, that was the most difficult day uh, because the sun was very high and then I got an opportunity he got an opportunity that we prayed uh, and that was the most beautiful time for us because we had we prayed with the jamaat uh, uh, on, in Madhya Pradesh. Subhanallah. Uh, Subhanallah. I think the masjid should offer a uh, Hajj preparation uh, a fitness course. <laughs> so we'll bring some UV light and put it and make you shave your head, put the UV light on your head, and then make you walk barefoot around Masjid Uthman. In the in the summer, hundred degree weather, uh, with a lungi and uh, the bathroom slippers, inshallah. So that can be uh, we can look forward to those programs, inshallah, and uh, we can have some of our brothers uh, volunteer to to lead that. So subhanallah, it's just it's scary. You know, I did not go for Hajj. I went for Umrah a long time ago. I was about twenty two, much more healthier, and I it resonates with me. It reminded me when I, when we were doing. Tawaf, after Tawaf going from Safa and Marwa, it's very nice, flat, smooth, marble, but you're barefoot. And as a 22-year-old, my foot had cracks, and it was hard. I, I felt it was sore. Like, I, don't, I haven't ever felt this before, but like, I could feel my bone, and the bone was sore because you're, you're continuously stepping on your heel bone. It's not easy. As a 22-year-old, and I used to run, I used to exercise back then. Subhanallah. And only Allah Ta'ala gives the strength to, to people. 80, uh, 70, 80, 90 years old people able to do all of this. So, um, next question. Can you share what was the most memorable memorable part of your hajj? Uh, is it just one or can I do two? Or whatever, yeah. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, I think uh, again, um, I have two answers, one from me and one from, from my wife. So for me, the most memorable part, I, I would uh, say it would be for everybody, no matter if you go to Hajj or Umrah, uh, seeing Kaaba for the first time. I mean, those who went to Umrah, they can, you know, 
agree with me that this is the most beautiful thing. I mean, imagine for all 20 years, 30 years, 40 years of your life, you've been saying that I'm praying, you know, in that direction, I'm looking towards it. And the first time you look at it, it's, it's you cannot, you cannot, you know, convey this through words. It's mesmerizing experience. So that, that was my best experience. That, that's the first thing. And the second thing uh, is, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about Masjid and Amirah, if that's okay. Right. So uh, again, this is the Masjid where uh, Rasulullah gave his last, uh, uh, you know, khutbah. So that's the most famous khutbah, right? So, uh, you know, where he tells that uh, Arabs are not, you know, superior to non-Arabs except for piety and things like that. So maybe Mufti Sahib can talk more about that, right? That masjid, uh, capacity of that masjid is uh, about 500,000 people, right? So that's a big masjid. But even though the capacity is 500,000 people, 3 million people want to pray there during that specific time because that's a very important sunnah, right? So for the prayer, uh, the khutbah that happens around 12.30, people are already there from 6 a.m. or even before that, right? So, uh, a lot of people who go to Hajj, I mean, obviously you go in a group, right? So the group leader tells you that, hey, it's up to you if you want to go or else we'll all stay in the tent, right? So for me, like I said, I was preparing about all these things. I'm like, one of the reasons why I'm doing this at an early age is I want to do all these things, right? I mean, what's the point if I cannot do all these things? So I was like, I am going to go to the Masjid and Amira, right? So this is done. I'm, I mean, Alhamdulillah, we've got phones. It's not like we'll get lost, and it's just a mile away, not even a mile away, a kilometer away. So I was ready to go for it, and uh, Alhamdulillah, almost uh, 11 people agreed in my group, a group of 45 people, and then we all started around 9 o'clock or 9.30, and then everybody was full. So we did not even get a chance to enter the masjid. It was very hot. I mean, even if there is a leaf, there are 10 people below that leaf. That's how it is. Like everybody wants to be in the shade. And then one of the experiences, everybody has an umbrella, like you cannot wear anything. So you have an umbrella in your hand. So this is, uh, this is when I got to know that how heat it is. So I had an umbrella. It has a steel uh, holding to it, right? So that became almost red. So imagine the heat on that. So when it touched my head, I was like, it, it was like touching an iron on your head. So that is how hard it was. I don't know if it was our fortune or whatnot, but we were standing right on the barricade, and then suddenly somebody jumped over it. So everybody just jumped inside. So we got lucky and we just went inside, alhamdulillah. So, and then they, by the time they could control all the 11 people, 10 out of 11 people were inside the masjid. So alhamdulillah, we got an opportunity to go inside. We went all the way uh, near the member almost, right? So that's in close, we went. Just kept walking, we just kept walking. And that was the best memorable for me because that masjid has a capacity of uh, 500,000 people and it's a big ground type of a masjid. It has three, four floors and every single one is reciting Talbiya. So imagine 500,000 people at once saying, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik. It was like, you know, the vibrations were all over the place. So it, it, no no amount of uh, subwoofers or speakers can compare to that. It was that better. But nobody is talking in mic. Everybody's just reciting. Like imagine everybody saying the same thing at the same time. So that was the most beautiful experience that I had. And then to my wife, I think uh, when all the rituals were complete, when we threw the uh, you know stones at the, the marath, and everybody started being happy. You know what? You've accomplished something big. You know. So that was the most memorable for her. She cried. All of us cried, you know. All the group, we did it at once. So we were all happy that, you know what, we become official hajis now. Alhamdulillah. So those are memorable experiences we had. Alhamdulillah. No? Beautiful. For me also, I'd say uh, the day of uh, Arpa, wherein we prayed in Majid and Imra. That was the more mem most memorial day for me. The reason, I mean, I was not lucky that he got a chance to go inside. I did not have the chance. But my whole group of 40 people were there in the bus. And the driver or the, or the uh, tour organizer, he said, oh, there is Majid and Imra. And then 
suddenly what happened, I don't know, my wife got up and she said, let's go. So <laughs> we were the only two people who got down from the bus. So we went there and then we prayed, but we were not so lucky. We were right at the door and then they shut down the door. So we came out and then we put the hasid and then we sat down on 49 degrees temperature. Uh, and then we had those umbrellas and then umbrellas you have to do like this because the air will not be there. There is no air at all. In Saudi, heat is only heat, like not like here in heat and air, both they come. No, it is completely only heat. So if you, if you need air, what we used to do was we used to do our, uh, everybody used to do like this. So if you see it like this, everybody's umbrellas, umbrellas are like this. So, and the heat was like, I, we were praying on the, what you call road, and then we put one hasid, and then we sat down. Within 10 seconds, the heat was so thick, then we got, no, no, we cannot sit. And then we put one more hasid. Then again, we sat down, again we got, no, no, it's not sufficient. So last thing we put, and we, we normally carry extra ayran, so I put my ayran, and then on that, we sat. so that was the most, uh, and then, uh, please, one request is, you know, when you are going for Hajj, you know, practice crying. Okay. So, <laughs> when you do dua, make sure that you do dua while crying. You have to, you, have to, you know, your uh, water has to come out from you. So that even I practice that a lot. So when you go for Hajj, make sure that, you know, when you do dua, cry and then do dua. That's more. Mashallah, these are very uh, important advices. Um, we should note these down. Um, whoever wants to go for next year, you can start now with these preparations. Not only physical, like I, if I go to your neighborhood, I want to see you and uh, Zawal time when the sun is directly above, no shoes, lungi, and just walking. And then you have to practice crying tahajjud time. So this is when the sun's up and when the sun's all the way down. Okay, so next question. Um, Imam Sahib can let me know if we have more time, inshallah. One more question, inshallah. Um, so I guess we can stop here. I know there's more. Maybe we can continue another time. I know the brothers have prepared, and, and this is extremely valuable. But we'll stop at this question. What three advices would you give to anyone that plans to go next year? So Brother Hasib already gave one, but if you could give three more or just two more, that's also fine. He gave a very good advice. Practice crying. Whether you're going for Hajj or not, this is really important. Three advices to those who want to go for Hajj next year. So I'll quickly say the three advices, and then I'll what one very important point is one you have to walk a lot, and then two you have to make sure that you know once you do wudu, you, you make a practice that that you stay in the state of wudu at least for three to four hours. That's more important. Like not like here you know we do wudu in, in Asar and then we also do in Maghrib. So make sure that you know you practice that once you do wudu, you you remain in the state of wudu for at least three to four hours, and then have a lot of patience, lot a lot because you walk for two kilometers, and then the policeman say get back from there you have to go that way. So again you have to go for two three kilometers. You cannot fight with the policeman. Okay, they're not here. <laughs> so have a lot of patience in you. Okay, yeah. and then. There will be people from different different countries, right? And everybody have this different way of approaching. Like in US, we, we give a lot of gap in sanity. And then somebody will come and push you. And then, you know, they do a lot of other things. So you need to have a lot of patience. You know, always keep a smile on your face. And other thing I wanted to add is don't depend on your pay on your kids for your hajj. Okay, because you know, irrespective of what age you are. If your knees and toes are fine, you can do Hajj. Even if you are at the age of 30, 40, if you are having issues with your, you know, you get hurt, you fall down, don't wait for that. You know? And then I have seen a lot of, uh, you know, the older age people, keep, their sons are, you know, taking the, what do you call it, wheelchair. And then a lot of their primary things, they get lost because, you know, uh, they have to do a lot of walking. We have to be... Uh, you know, you have to go and do jamrat, right? And then they push the wheelchair and the screws, they come out. Mm. So, oh. and that is one more suggestion that if you're, if you're taking your parent and you're taking on the wheelchair, make sure that you carry all the screwdrivers or something. Now, imagine the, the wheel has came out and there will be nobody that can help you. 
you have to go back 10 kilometers to the market, buy the new wheelchair, or you have to get the screws and then fit it. But till that time, so your parents, your your father, mother, the child, everybody has to stand. So these are all the problems that you'll face. So my suggestion is don't wait till don't wait till you get old. I have so many responsibilities. Uh, you know, in my case, I decided in the month of February itself that I'm going. And then I was planning, doing some financial planning and learn, and then suddenly it came to my way, I, I, I have the money, I don't have any responsibilities, let me finish my primary responsibilities. That's why I said, let me put all of my money in this one. So that's the few suggestions from my side. I think brother covered all the preparations. I think uh, I have pretty much the same advices. But in addition to that, I one advice that I really wanted to reiterate was that uh, I watched Umar Suleiman's video in terms of Hajj. He has an hour video. He only talks about physical preparations, what he needs, the, the actual needs, what type of ihram would be helpful, where what do you do? He, he takes it from end to you know beginning to end. In in an hour, he completes all the activities. Uh, that's really helpful, especially for people who live in North America, because he talks about where you will be most hot uh, weather and everything like that. So, and what type of things you need to carry. I mean, he carries on uh, carry on for Hajj every time. He just takes a carry on. That's it. So everything else, uh, you know, will be taken care. Of. So I, I think uh, I'd just like to add one more thing. So in terms of preparation, uh, I think that's the next question. But I'm going to take only two seconds to talk about that. So my preparation was actually from last year. So last year, uh, Mukti Saab did one of the Hajj programs during the Hajj times. I forgot the name of the program. But uh, he was talking about how important Hajj is and all that. That's the day me and my wife decided on that. that you know what, we have to go for Hajj. This is the time. And then uh, of the Dua, we started from the day that we decided it was last year's Hajj. From that day, our primary Dua was only Hajj. So my intention was like, until I go to Hajj, my only dua will be Hajj. The entire Ramadan, you know, you have a list of things that you want and all that, right? So I kept everything aside. So my primary dua is, let me get to Hajj. And inshallah, when I get to Hajj, I'll have more. I'll have another bigger list, I'll take about that. So that's the thing, so your dua is more important. Only dua can give you there. So, I mean, my group, group coordinator said that there were a lot of kings in India and everywhere else, right? Like Akbar and all these guys. They had all the wealth they need, but they never got a chance to do hajj. So it's not about wealth, it's not about physical fitness, it's not about all these things. It's just the dua, and you are willing to go there. So, make a lot of duas, and like Mukti Sahib said, prepare it today. If you want to go tomorrow, next year, coming year, whatever, prepare it today. And inshallah, Allah will give you an opportunity. Mashallah, these were, this is, uh, if only we knew how valuable this is. You, you have to pay for this kind of stuff. It's really important. Um, case in point, after Salat al Maghrib, you owe the brothers $100 each or something. <laughs> oh, that's a big job. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, their, dua, their, their reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah ta'ala give them Jannah to for those for, for all of these beautiful advices. So, two more things that Brother Hasi wanted to share. I'm going to recap after these two, the advices. I think this is one of the most important things. Because this comes from personal experience. You, you can't find this in books. So, he said, write your duas on paper. Very important because you think like, oh, I'm going to make this dua, I'm going to make that dua. You'll forget it. At that time, the heat is there, someone pushed you, the patience is at its you know, brim. You're going to forget everything. Write it down on paper. And this is not just for Hajj. I also encourage everyone to have a dua list. Whether that is mental, you memorized it. If you cannot do that, you have to write it down. And start with the tahajjud. And how beautiful is it, Brother Uthman, since as a family, since they intended, the only dua, Ramadan, before Ramadan, after Ramadan, Hajj, Hajj, Hajj. This is, we have to show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we want it. It's not being passive, oh, I didn't get my visa. What did you do to show Allah? If Allah accepted you, you'll get the visa. So you did dua non-stop, tahajjud time. Make that list what you really want. So that's one advice that uh, Brother Hasib really wanted to pass on. Another one, very important, 
and pertinent for people that the newer generation older generation alhamdulillah you guys don't have this issue the newer generation we have this obsession photos all the time you're in front of you're going to be in front of the qabr of nabi sallallahu in the most mubarak place taking a selfie with rasulullah sallallahu alaihi this is not proper etiquette you know nabi sallallahu alaihi is in his grave it's not proper etiquette you start taking pictures selfies instagram all of this stuff that's not the time and place how many times you see people they touch the Kaaba Sharif. Let me get that. You got your reward there. With Allah, who knows? Allah will say, okay, you got your photo. You got a thousand likes. Take that. Yom al Qiyamah, you got nothing with me. Is that what you want? In front of the Kaaba Sharif, like this, you know, a group of people, like, you know, flexing and all of this in front of the Kaaba Sharif and taking a picture. That's not the time and place. You are supposed to be a slave at that moment, not a person showing off. Show, pictures are showing off. You want to show the world what I'm doing. This is when you cry and when you when you humble yourself. So I'm going to quickly mention this, inshallah, and then we have another uh, thing that we have to take care of. Please bear with us. We know we're, we're trying to be as approximate as possible with the timings. And there's actually more, so we'll, we'll try to see if we can get more information from our brothers uh, because it's really valuable, and I'm, I'm really enjoying this. So now to summarize... I'm going to start with some of uh, Brother Hasib's, and, and I know some of this is also uh, Brother Uthman's advice. Always smile. From now on, practice smiling, even if it makes you look funny. Assalamualaikum, brother. Like, what's wrong with this brother? There's something wrong with him. There's actually a teacher that was a mufti sub that I knew. He would smile so much that I actually thought that there was something wrong with his intellect. He turns out he's very intelligent, but he would just smile so much. So, smile a lot and practice patience. Walk a lot. They're talking, I hear 10K a lot. So I'm getting kind of scared. Yeah. 52,000 steps. 52,000 steps. In one, in in one, one day. day. Yeah, that, that's the hardest trip. Yeah, Allah. Right after the day of our 52,000 steps. That, that's a marathon. So. It would be more than 60, 70 yeah, climbs upstairs. Yeah, Allah. 60, 70 climbs upstairs, uphill. So walk, whatever you can do. And then ultimately, it's, it's with Allah. Because I was planning on doing something, but. Uh, you say 52 km. Um, take an IV, IVs, yeah. liquid IVs. It is absolutely needed. I mean, only the, yeah, because water. You only water. A couple of times. Don't do water. coke and juice no, and no, all of this no. stuff. You're not there to enjoy. You're a slave, right? So walk a lot and try without shoes sometimes as well. Do it while young, right? For those of us who have become advanced in age, do it ASAP. For those of us who are younger, do it while young, while you have the chance. So many of us have this oper- this this mentality. I'll do tawbah after I do hajj, so then you delay it. No, stop. Do it right now. Inshallah, Allah gives the tawfiq for tawbah. Carry tools for wheelchairs if you're going to help people with wheelchairs. These are really important uh, experience-based advices. Watch Sheikh Umar Suleiman's video about all the necessities that are you know physical preparations. Experience based again, you cannot find these in books. Make dua from the day you intend Hajj. If it's now, this is your dua. Allah take me for Hajj. And again, write duas on paper, have a dua list, not just for Hajj, for now, for daily life, and do not take too many photos. We need to detach from all of this love of social media. Not just for Hajj again. This is daily life. We're obsessed with this stuff. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give our beloved brothers, our sisters, our families that have gone for Hajj and come back a Hajj Mabrur. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow this to be their first step into Jannatul Firdaus and allow them to continue to go for Hajj. And those of us who haven't gone, may Allah ta'ala also give us Hajj Mabrur. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So now we have some uh, information. Jazakallah again want to the brothers and to the sisters uh, who have shared their information with us. Imam Saab has a presentation for us. Uh, please uh, bear with patience and uh, while the fruit is being prepared. We were supposed to end, I believe, 8.05. I'm going to try to cut, wrap all of this within seven minutes. I'll, I'll try to make it shorter. Bismillah. Announcements. So we have three parts. Programs that we just passed, upcoming deadlines, and programs that are upcoming. So what we just passed, last family program, alhamdulillah, if uh, I can get all the brothers and sisters' attention, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Sisters, don't feel shy. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah. 
So the programs that we actually announced at the last family program, we alhamdulillah, with tawfiq, we completed those programs. So we had our Salah summer camp, we had our two hadith intensives, and we had two middle school youth programs run by our youth. We, me, Ustada, we had nothing to do with it other than some advice. They ran the whole program from beginning to end. They were there, they did the logistics, brought the food, they ordered the food, they took care of the payments, they sent the receipts and emails, they made sure that the program material was prepared, they had uh, all of the bayans and everything looked over and supervised to make sure that their content is good and it's in the right direction. They, I mean, they had meetings before, they had meetings after, and they had two programs like this throughout the summer, alhamdulillah. The first one was a icebreaker and the second one was regarding the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So alhamdulillah, we had programs in the uh, summer that we just passed. Also, part of our summer camp, it was focused on salah. And so I just want to quickly share with you some recaps of what we did in the summer camp. <laughs> It was a beautiful program. I know I just started with Salah and then you saw the Kaaba. So we had one week because it was in the middle of uh, the Hajj season, our summer camp. Uh, the, I mean, the Hajj time came in the middle of our summer program. We had one week where we focused on uh, the, you know, all the arkan of Hajj, the rituals of Hajj. And we actually had a full day where we imitated all of the, the, the entire process of Hajj. So that's why you saw the Kaaba. That's why you saw the you know the jamarat that were standing and the little the the white paper balls that was the the, the stones that the kids were throwing yeah, it was a lot of fun then at the end of the summer camp it was a salah summer camp so we came outside we used a compass to find the qibla we used prayer mats to pray on we used a eight ounce water bottle to make wudu and we did this all outside to experience that you can pray salah wherever you are and then the compass, the salah mat. Oh, we also did dhikr with the digital uh, dhikr uh, tracker. And so we gave all of that as a packet to the kids to take home as a gift as well. So it was a very beautiful program. As you can see, the kids, mashallah, they found the qibla, they stood and they prayed. And that's why you see a bunch of water bottles around them because they use water, that water to make wudu. Ayuwa. Next, program deadline. So that's what we did in the summer. Alhamdulillah, we asked Allah SWT for qubul. Program deadlines. We have our Saturday school Quran classes and a, a community Umrah trip. So our Saturday school registration ends this weekend, August 6th, Sa Sunday, tomorrow, 11.59, we are going to uh, end the registration. There will be a grace period for one week, but the price will double. At that point, I wouldn't even recommend. I would say just wait for next year. <laughs> right? All jokes aside, make sure you get in by this weekend, inshallah, so that we can prepare properly. For some reason, if you delay, just talk to us, inshallah, and we'll, we'll try to see what we can do. We have our uh, yearly sisters' uh, Quran classes with Shaykh Sahar, but this year we're introducing the brother's side as well. So there will be a brother's Quran class at that same time from 9.30 to 10.30, 10.45, right before our Saturday classes. So this will begin on the same day, August 18th, and uh, August 19th, Afwan, and the registration will close right before that, or whenever the seats fill up. For Shaykh Sahar, as soon as we send out the, the link, usually it fills up within a couple of days. So for the sisters, I wouldn't wait if you want to register for her class. Uh, for the brothers, this is the first time we're doing it. I don't think I'm as popular, so you can probably wait until the last minute. You'll still find plenty of seats. Um, last but not least, um, uh, our Umrah trip, uh, we posted about it. August 10th, if you're interested, reach out to me, inshallah. Upcoming programs. Alhamdulillah, we have... Uh, old uh, initiatives, new initiatives, and uh, we have a collaboration uh, right around the, the corner. We have our monthly ziyara that we do, and alhamdulillah, we're resuming this month. Tomorrow, we are going to Darul Barzaf, Newton County, to do ziyara of all of the Muslims that are buried there, make dua for them, and especially our local sister, Sira, uh, sister Awa Diop. We're going to, uh, usually we don't decide on a place until we, the morning of, 
to see everyone's schedule. But because we just did the janaza, we did the burial last week, uh, this is most appropriate for us to go uh, send our du'as uh, this week, inshallah. So we are going to go visit her and uh, make du'a for her and all of those who have passed away, including for our own selves and our own family members uh, that have passed away and those who are alive as well. So Darul Barzaf, Newton County at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning, inshallah. Number two, uh, a new initiative, another new initiative, Monthly Sisters Halaqa with Ustada Nafiha. She will be running a uh, halaqa uh, monthly on Fridays from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. This is only for sisters. And um, there's more info There's a flyer in the back. All you have to do is show up on the date. So jot down the date, show up, and then after that, she'll guide you as to the next steps if there's any WhatsApp group or registration, et cetera, et cetera. Number three, our monthly youth programs. Both now we're having the... Uh, middle school youth program and the high school college youth program simultaneously at the end of every month. So keep your eyes out for that. And last but not least, Alhamdulillah, we have a collaboration coming up. It might be difficult to see. Let me see if I can zoom in. We are doing a, a collaboration with Muna. This is a Muna event that's being hosted by Masir Uthman. The event will take place here next Sunday. Uh, Hajj before, during, and after. We have Imam Inayatullah, Sheikh Abdullah Khan, and uh, our very own Sheikh Mufti Nafis, who will be speaking on that day between 6.30 and Maghrib. Um, the topic is about Hajj, and Imam Inayatullah will, will focus on sincerity. You can think of it as before you go, before you uh, embark on this journey, what mindset you should have. Sheikh uh, Abdullah, uh, Mufti, Mufti Nafis will be talking about the rituals and what they... Uh, what are the metaphors and, or the symbols that are there and what you should be thinking about as you go through the rituals. It's not just meaning, meaningless motions. There's meaning behind each and every ritual that's there, that's done. So Mufti Sahib will talk about during the Hajj what to think about. And then Sheikh Abdullah Khan will, inshallah, talk about uh, an accepted Hajj, what that looks like. And you can think of that as the after, uh, looking at Hajj uh, in hindsight. So this program will take place uh, next Sunday, not Saturday, Sunday. The RSVP link will be sent out, inshallah. This flyer will also be sent out. And uh, there will be food, inshallah. It will be packed to go. So on the way out, everyone can take their share. So these are, mashallah, all of our programs that we've done, that we're doing, and that we will do, inshallah. If you uh, would like to support our programs, you can donate through Cash, Zelle, or the website. And on the brother side, we have the kiosks. If you have any questions about the programs or any questions in general, just email us at info at masiruthmanatlanta.org. Again, info at masiruthmanatlanta.org. Or you can text me at 678-576-8372. And as always, shukran, jazakallah khair for your continuous support through your time, sacrifices, wealth, and du'as. I went over time. Sorry. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.